All right, Jennings, please edit this part out. Whoops. There we go. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to be outlining the basic ways that you're able to write a Congress speech. It's a pretty complicated subject, and there's a lot of customizability in how you want to develop your own style. But it's probably pretty helpful to go over the basics. You have to master the core foundations of the events before you're able to start customizing yourself. So let's get started. First, as a brief roadmap, I'm going to talk about speeches in chronological order of how they're generally given in the round. We're going to start with the first speech of the round, usually known as the sponsorship, move on to constructives, which encompass most of the round and are generally the most important, and then touch on late round speeches, which are also known as crystals. But before we do any of that, we need to have a brief note on intros. Congress and Extemp share two similarities within their intros, the AGD and the LINK. Both of these are like what they are in Extemp, though powerful rhetoric is generally more popular in Congress, whereas Extemp is more of a fan of jokes and background as a way to start their AGD. Congress doesn't really have backgrounds or a significant statement or a question. After your AGD and your link, you just dive straight into your speech. Because unlike an extemp speech, you're relying on previous speeches to contextualize exactly what's going on in the round. So you don't want to waste any of your precious three minutes on doing that yourself. Unless, of course, you're the first speech in the round. In which case, it's basically your job to be the background and significant statements for the other speakers who want to pass this legislation. The same is generally true for the first negative speech. They set the groundwork for everyone else who wants to fail. So let's look at exactly how you structure one of these sponsorships. Generally, you want to introduce the core topic of the debate. And you also want to introduce all of the parts of the legislation. If this is a complicated sort of bill, be sure to explain all of the different mechanisms, subsections, all of that, and exactly what they do. Because judges have a habit of not reading legislation, and they'll really like you if you tell them just what it does. In addition to that, or rather, if it's a resolution and there's not much to explain, just the resolve clause, you can spend more time reading evidence about how likely it is that the legislation is actually going to solve the problems you'll talk about, which is something that your opposition will probably bring up. In the end, the goal that you're trying to accomplish with your sponsorship is shaping the ideas that the rest of the debate is going to be about. If people are still referencing your the arguments you brought up in this speech late into the round, then good job for you. And as a result, this isn't the time to be clever. You'll get the Tigger joke if you've read the Tao of Pooh, but even if you don't, if you have some out of the box, unique argument that's like going to impress the judges, that's something you should save for a little bit later in the round because other people aren't going to bring those arguments up quite as often. You just want to give them what's obvious and outline it in a way that makes a lot of sense. So that way you're going to continue to be referenced and make a big impact on the round. And that's what's important. So let's look at how you sponsor, or rather structure a sponsorship. There's two pretty similar ways to do it, but these are going to be like one cohesive point. You always start with a problem and ask what's wrong with the world right now. That's pretty self-explanatory. But then, and it's very important to spend a good chunk of the speech on this, but then there's a couple of options that you have. You can either jump straight to the impact and tell us why the problem that we're solving is so bad. Generally, like the, you want to go beyond like the typical problem here, uh, like in, of a, in and of itself. For example, if like the problem I was discussing is the government spends too much money, then like sure, that's a bad thing. But for the impact, you want to go a little bit further than that and like talk about all of the programs that are being defunded as a result of this waste. It's something extra to make the judge care more about the problem that you're talking about. Then in this scenario, you can go down to your solution and outline how your legislation can fix this problem. Alternatively, you can flip that. Talk about the solution just after you talk about the problem and then establish why it all matters. It's up to you. But that's generally how you're going to format a sponsorship. Now, it's time for a bit of homework. 
go to YouTube and search UKY TUC 2020 CD final round, and then watch the sponsorship shoots for this round, which is given at 25 minutes and two seconds. I want you to write down the gist of the speaker's problem, solution, and impact. We'll come back next class and discuss what you got and what I got. Now it's time for constructives, which are generally the most important part of the round. It both constructs specific arguments and refutes other speakers that have all said the opposite. And this is Tigger time. You want to bring out the most complicated, or not necessarily the most complicated, but the most unique and powerful arguments you have at your disposal. There's a lot of different ways to structure a constructive speech, but let's go over the basics. Generally, your points are going to follow a structure called claim warrant impact, which is kind of like an extent point, but with one of the subpoints missing. The claim is the topic sentence of your argument. It's the words that you want the judge to remember that summarizes the whole of what you're trying to say after you've finished convincing them that, they, that it's true. What you want them to write down on their ballots. And it's just, it's a, like the topic sentence. It summarizes the argument. Of course, you can't just claim something and not back it up. Your warrant is here to prove why your claim is true. By the time you're done with the warrant part of your point, your audience should understand why your claim is true and what exactly like the details are and what it looks like. Of course, like claim and impact don't really matter unless you explain the ultimate impact of like what the point is of talking about this in the first place. We've discussed impacts before, but a lot of people really skip over them and that's something you can't afford to do. A lot of judges are really lazy, and if you don't explain to them like the sheer significance of what you're talking about, you can't count on them to do the work for you. You need to be sure to humanize like your point and make sure that they really care about what you have to say. Sometimes you don't have to use claim or an impact. There are all alternatives, but that, that's generally more advanced. Then you can proceed to a standard point two, or there's a couple of other options. In Congress, you don't really have to have two distinct points. If you want to, you can do something called unified analysis, which is basically where you keep expanding on your first point on and on and on when relating it to other people's speeches and really qualifying exactly what it means to the round. If you can do this with a really important point, then that can be a lot better than having two distinct ones. In Congress, more quality argumentation is better than more argumentation. Alternatively, if one of your points becomes useless later on in the round, for example, if somebody else gives it, and now if you were to give it as well, it will be redundant, you can do something called a half refutation. This is basically where you drop one of your points and spend that time instead refuting the arguments of the other side. You still want this to follow claim or an impact, but instead of talking about your own arguments, you're saying, Representative X said blah, 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 but here's why they're wrong. It's going to do this and then you continue on like that. You just want to get an important impact that, that was given out by somebody who you think is winning the round right now, and then you need to try to break that down. And of course, you still have the same kind of conclusion from earlier. Or, no, I didn't, never mind. Okay, so the conclusions inside of these speeches are generally like one to two lines, and because you have so much less time than extemp, you're usually running out of time near the end of your speeches. You just want the zinger lines that you would normally give at the very end of an extemp conclusion. Something to give an emotionally charged ending to the whole of your speech. I promise this is the last bit of homework that I'm giving you, but I want you to go back to the same video and watch the speech at 59.53. It's a half refutation. I want you to write down the gist of the speech's claim, her warrant, and her impact for both of her points, and then we'll go over it together. Finally, let's look at the very late round. An important thing about Congress to understand is that introducing brand new arguments gets less effective as the round goes on. Once the framework of the debate has already been set, bringing up just something completely unrelated doesn't really draw in the audience quite as much. Everyone's kind of paying less and less attention as time goes on. And if you don't interact with something they were already paying attention to, if you just give the same thing later on, they're a lot more likely to tune you out and you won't do as well. To prevent them from tuning you out, late round speeches are generally almost entirely refutation. 
they're trying to change the way that previous speakers contextualized what the round is actually about and introduce new perspectives that shift the way that the judges like think the round uh, think about like core pieces that it has revolved around so far. So what do I mean by that? Well, for a crystal, you generally want to identify the two most important ideas that the round has centered around. A topic, an impact, an argument, whatever it is. Those are your two points. And like exactly how you go about a crystal, it's very flexible because so all each round is unique and develops in a very different way based on what everybody puts into it. You can't really predict what's going to happen. As a matter of fact, most crystals are written in rounds. But here's just like a general process that can get you into the feel of it before you become experienced and start being able to do them yourselves. Inside of each of your points, you first need to contextualize why you chose this particular topic. So like if I were to going to do this, I would probably bring up all of the speakers that have brought it up so far, offer a really brief summary of what they said, and then talked about how crucial it is to the arguments of their side. Then after I'm done like preempting the impact on the round of exactly what my point is going to do, I introduce a new argument that changes the dynamic following the claim or an impact structure. This is kind of confusing and I'm not going to make you take notes on a crystal yet. I just want you to keep them in mind. You can learn about them later in the year. And really that's most of what I have to say. Thanks everyone.